Yeah, I'm. All so, right, welcome back, everyone. Um, our next talk will be listening to Gloria telling us about justificatory injustice. Um, yeah, thank you the way. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me at this conference, and uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure um, to talk to you. And uh, I'm. I really regret that I can't be with you in person, but I hope that maybe in the future I'll be able uh, to join you at some point. Um, yeah. Uh, Thank you. So my um, topic is uh, what I call uh, justificatory injustice. And um, I want to say in the beginning that I have actually been doing like a lot of very abstract conceptual work and meta ethics before I found like the courage to confront myself with this like real life cases and problems. Um, but I found the epistemic injustice concept very helpful to understand um, a certain phenomenon that I was very interested in. And um, uh, like uh, when I worked on uh, theories of practical reasons and justification, I was especially interested in the fact that um, like all this is uh, a social phenomenon and uh, justification is always justification to particular people, uh, reasons that can be shared with particular people, accepted by particular people. And I think uh, when there are um, inequalities in a social structure, um, there can be problems that have to be taken seriously by a theory of reasons. And I think um, the epistemic injustice uh, conceptions that are out there in the literature and that um, uh, that could help um, to um, pinpoint uh, this problem. Yeah, um, I call this concept uh, justificatory injustice and the definition, which I will also will develop now, but here it is in the beginning, um, uh, we can speak of justificatory injustice when the reason that justifies an ethically well-supported decision is not available to the person who needs it to justify their action and this unavailability is due to their disadvantaged position in an unjust social hierarchy. And I think that this is a cluster phenomenon so that it has different aspects, but we have to analyze them together. And uh, I will like try to show you uh, three different uh, varieties. And all these varieties, I would say, are varieties of epistemic injustice. Um, but with regard to the epistemology as it is specific to uh, understanding and using uh, practical reasons. And I think we really have to think the epistemology and the practice uh, together even more than we have to do in like other um, kinds of um, uh, reasons or other kinds of um, uh, epistemology. And um, this concept of justificatory injustice um, has certain similarities, especially to the concept of hermeneutical injustice. But I think when it comes to hermeneutics of practical reasons, um, we have to take some specific aspects into account. It also has some entanglements with um, things that have been described, testimonial injustice or Vele's concept of explanatory injustice. Uh, but I still would think it is another uh, concept um, and uh, it cannot be reduced um, to any of the concepts that exists. Um, and this is mostly because of the nature of uh, practical justification. And uh, when I say practical justification, so I think maybe some phenomena are a bit narrower than all practical reasons, but they are maybe also a bit broader than morality. I sometimes I say ethical reasons, but I think it's things that are important for human life and that have to be justified uh, to ourselves and to others. Yeah, and um, so I developed a paradigm case to show where this um, justificatory injustice um, can occur. So um, here you see the case. Uh, so I constructed that case, I invented these two names, um, contrasted them, but actually the phenomenon is based a lot on literature, especially on uh, Jennifer Morton's uh, recent book, um, 
which is called uh, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, The Ethical Costs of Upwards Mobility. And uh, that book examines uh, the situation of disadvantaged students uh, in the US, but uh, it has also been discussed in many European countries and it is, um, uh, yeah, in most modern capitalist societies, um, there is like something like that problem. And um, yeah, the case um, is like this. Um, so uh, two young people are facing the choice of a professional path. Both are living in a modern capitalist society, have excellent grades and consider considerable talent and inclination for a research career. Maria is the oldest of many children of a religious immigrant family living in a poor working class environment. Mark, by contrast, is the only child of an upper middle class family living among liberal academics. For each of them, we could say that the scientific or societal value or personal value, whatever we say their value is, the value of the research they could potentially do, given their talent and inclination, gives them a reason for investing into a research career. And uh, still, we can see that youths like Maria are significantly less likely to carry through with a research career than youths like Mark. And this usually remains so even when states offer financial support and affirmative action. And of course, um, uh, we have, there are a lot of uh, different reasons why this could be uh, uh, the case. Um, but, um, you know, like we have heard a lot now on also like imposter syndrome, there might be different kinds of min minority distress, there might be different kinds of um, uh, stereotype threat, whatever. But um, the specific problem that Morton is pointing out, and she has also conducted interviews um, with um, students having like roughly these uh, characteristics and um, she uh, pointed out that there is also a very deep ethical conflicts and um, the result is that like instead people with Maria's characteristics are more likely to opt for work in service or care than to proceed within higher education or like with research or like um, something that gives you a career in certain types of uh, leadership in the state for example also and um, uh, yeah and she pointed uh, out um, also by showing these interviews and the situations of these people, even those who are very successful, who can do financially, who get who getting along, they have they have very deep uh, ethical struggles also, and they often decide to drop out because they don't identify with that career, um, that higher education careers, and it is a very strong agency often, often but it is also a result of a deep ethical conflict and um, not just intimidation and discrimination. And um, then we could of course ask, why is that a problem at all? Because we, of course, like service and care work um, and research or higher education, they are probably equally valuable. But the problem occurs in a certain social structure that uh, working in service or care um, comes with greater risk of poverty and also lesser power to determine the conditions of life and work. That's something that we see in most capitalist societies, probably, that uh, the power over these uh, resources and infrastructure is often with people um, who are very distant from it and um, it, uh, it disadvantages disadvantages you um, to work um, in uh, service or care professions. And um, then the no another aspect that Morton also points out is that um, uh, Maria, um, given her experiences that could uh, facilitate change or do things differently, might even have more reason or an additional reason uh, compared to Mark to reach, reach a position of influence. Um, would be a possibility to abolish um, injustice. And um, of course, uh, now we can discuss if that's her job at all. We discussed exploitation yesterday, um, but I would still say like just the mere fact that um, a person like her instead of a person like Mark um, gets to understand and determine things is uh, better, is, is in itself um, a step 
towards abolishing injustice and getting in a new perspectives. Um, um, and the fact that people, I mean, maybe it's not an individual person could be justified, but in, on the structural level, that people like Maria are uh, less likely to act on those reasons confirms uh, the, the status quo. Uh, that is uh, the problem. And um, um, Martin uh, suggests that um, disadvantaged students who move up the social ladder pay high costs that are genuinely ethical, that compromise their moral identity and values in a way that is not the same uh, for students from coming from uh, positions of advantage in society. And uh, the phenomena she describes is that uh, people who have to live have to leave their families, uh, the neighborhood uh, to study, um, uh, have to uh, compromise um, their social ties, uh, re relations of loyalty to the group. And very often, and that's the probably most severe problem is that they have to drop family members who need financial help or care, of course, is people in uh, rich families could also need care, but there are is much less need that children give up their whole career for it, for example. And uh, all these problems that are specific um, uh, for certain groups uh, in a society, they make that uh, it, it is a high ethical cost to opt for higher education. Even so, it would be, um, it would be actually good if, if those people uh, would do it. And there would be very strong reasons to do it. And um, yeah, now let's have a look at um, different interpretations. Um, so, and yeah, I said, um, uh, so I'm now, I'm not talking about um, other structural factors. Um, I'm just talking about um, why um, do, why does it seem that people like Maria are less responsive to the reasons for higher education? And I'm in a very simple, but also uh, in many respects, problematic interpretation would be that um, it is just because of upbringing and culture, there's a limited understanding of those reasons. And uh, I mean, an example of that, um, uh, like uh, Marta Nussbaum's work on adapted preferences. Um, um, and yeah, maybe you heard about these things that um, uh, she, um, had also project with uh, women from, but it was also not in this kind of society and not people who have already been to higher education or had the possibility, um, but people who have never heard of, um, of reading, writing and um, these types of education and uh, just giving the possibility to imagine it, uh, to, to understand it could help to make them want to do it. But I would say like, maybe this explains some of the cases why people from this working cl uh, class background um, would not be as responsive to reasons for higher education but also if we see like in societies where there is uh, information and also if we see that this um, concerns adult people who are very intelligent and it occurs on all levels like even on people who have done a phd there is still this uh, tendency to drop out uh, of research career afterwards if you have these characteristics um that's actually an implausible um, interpretation but still it's an aspect to keep in mind um but it could also potentially be disrespectful or harmful to attribute it to limited understanding and um yeah often there are many other reasons um for it um, the second um, possibility um, of interpretation um, would be that um, people um, from this background have a limited possibility for sharing reasons with their environment. It might be difficult to communicate or, or share the reasons because there would be no uptake or a mistaken uptake due to prejudices. Um, uh, Frigga's uh, testimonial injustice uh, how she describes it could come in or also uh, what really described um, in a recent paper that um, when when we uh, take up these people's reasons or talk about them we will give explanations that are actually not uh, the good reasons they might have but they are other causes that we use to explain um, their behavior for example um, a person like maria might uh, be interpreted as egoist or arrogant if she opts for higher education uh, and 
people might not even take up the reason that she's actually creating value also by this career. And I think that is a serious problem, but um, uh, also um, we have to take it serious. So uh, this is also a problem that um, occurs often within the disadvantaged uh, groups like that, or especially of the women in disadvantaged group uh, face this. And uh, yeah, there's problems of, of intersectionality probably. Um, but I think also if you just say that um, the environment uh, doesn't understand um, these reasons or they don't want her to succeed. I think that could also be a shortcoming. And we misunderstand the ethical struggles and ambivalences within the disadvantaged group as um, mere ignorance or intolerance. So this is also an aspect, but I don't think it is uh, also the whole truth of the phenomenon. We could say, wouldn't that dependent family member that was dropped for a career have a point in accusing Maria of egoism or arrogance? And sometimes they are not even accusing them, but still these people feel um, uh, this ethical struggle or ambivalence about their careers. And um, that's why I bring up this third interpretation, uh, which I call a situational silencing of reasons. So the apparent lack of responsiveness to higher education reasons it can neither be reduced to limitations in understanding the reasons nor in problems in sharing those reasons with others, but um, the reasons for higher education cannot function as reasons in Maria's life because they are effectively silenced by reasons for care because um, maybe you have to move very far away from your community. You um, have to decide if the limited resources you have should go, you should be invested into into your training or if they should be used to help your brother who's a drug addict, your mom who is um, very sick. Um, these were all cases like in Morgan's book. And um, so um, why do we need um, a new concept here? So I have like two possible interpretations um, of interpreting the case without an epistemic injustice uh, concept. Uh, but I think uh, Maria's case is uh, more than that. Um, one interpretation would be that, like from norm normative perspective, this is uh, personal hardship. So, what? So, the question to begin with is, what does Maria, as an individual person, have reason to do? Maybe not what society should do, but really, what should this person do? Um, if you so, she's in this situation, and one possibility could be to say that the situation is very hard for her. But the normative reason balance might indeed count in favor of uh, care. Um, so moving to your community, work in a care profession, maybe also be closer to your uh, friends and family and be able to support them that you could not do if you would go to a city uh, and uh, make this uh, career. And uh, like someone could uh, like have this view. Somebody could say that even Mark, a person like Mark, um, could sincerely say that, yeah, if my, my parents were that sick, if my, my siblings needed this help, um, I would give it, I would sacrifice this. I don't think that uh, a career um, justifies that. Um, I would do the same in, in her shoes. But the problem is that people like Maria are more likely uh, systematically, structurally, uh, than him to end up with that reason uh, balance and that this enforces or reinforces those um, inequalities. Um, um, and yeah, it seems that the reason is silence for Maria, but um, it's a question, does she really have no reason in this situation? Um, because we could say there is this transformative reason, but um, how should we conceive of that? Um, and another, um, Con another interpretation that is often brought up in, in literature about transformation, for example, Agnes Kellert's um, a very recent book, um, uh, we could say that there is an existential um, dilemma. So there are good reasons for higher education, for transforming society in that way, but also good reasons for care. Maybe there could also be transformation, but either choice um, is costly and Maria must choose who she wants to be and uh, what she most care, cares for. And like uh, existential dilemma that could of course also occur for people like Mark, should you disappoint your family? Should you realize something you really care for? Um, 
and you have to just make an existential choice by identifying with one thing and just externalize the other thing. Um, but um, here, the problem for Maria still remains um, because uh, on the one hand, I, if she identifies with reasons for care, she re I mean, I wouldn't say she reinforces, but this choice um, unintentionally reinforces um, contributes to injustice. Um, but if you if she opts for higher education and externalizes all her reasons for care, like her sense of social responsibility or community loyalty, she actually undermines the very reasons for doing that, namely transforming and, and making society a better place. And that's also what Morton describes in another paper about the miseducation of elites, that actually people who should bring diversity are actually forced to become like, um, like the like the people in the elites and um, my uh, aspect of that might also be oppressive uh, double binds, but I'm not gonna go into this now. Um, and I think uh, what we have to say in this case is that um, uh, there, there is actually this transformative reason. Uh, so it's not uh, Agnes Callard, for example, she also says that this identification externalization model um, does not work for transformative cases. So there might be a transformative reason, but it is not yet available or is not in this situation available um, uh, to Maria due to the unjust uh, social structure. And um, that's how I come to this um, uh, definition that we need this concept of justificatory injustice. Um, um, that reasons that justify ethically well-supported decisions so that Maria becomes a researcher or some other societal a leader by uh, going through higher education, by going through these um, institutions would be ethically well-supported, but it is not available um, to her. Um, and it is not available to her due to her disadvantaged position in an unjust uh, social hierarchy. And I think we can compare it to uh, Fricker's concept of hermeneutical injustice. You know, Fricker had this idea that uh, in the knowledge structure, there could be uh, what she calls a hermeneutical lacuna. So like a white spot, um, like there's a concept lacking, like the concept of uh, sexual harassment in her one of her examples. And um, this uh, lack disadvantages or this white spot um, um, disadvantages a person by obscuring important parts of their experience. And I think similar to this, there is this uh, normative lacuna, which makes justificatory injustice. And I think here are the different types again. And you can also see here that um, uh, is, there is more to it than uh, to these cases where we lack um, a concept that is for understanding and experience. And when you have a you lack, um, when you lack a possibility to make a reason uh, available as a reason, as a justificatory reason to you. So I have these three concepts. Um, they are in line with the three interpretations. I just gave um, the simplest, but also sometimes problematic form is there are injustices in normative under understanding. A reason that justifies a choice which is important for someone's life cannot be understood due to upbringing in the disadvantaged group. That would be a problem of what we would say, simple or general hermeneutics, uh, so about just understanding a phenomenon. And it is very similar to epistemic practice that are not about practical normativity. Um, but um, when we come to injustice in normative communication, as I call it, that's when a reason that justifies a choice which is important for someone's life cannot be used in justificatory communication with one's surrounding due to membership in a disadvantaged group. And um, this is um, a problem of the hermeneutics of practical uh, reasons, I would say. So it's a question if we should use the term hermeneutics, but of, I think, um, and uh, what I think is a good conception is uh, Calhoun's conception of uh, uh, morality. She says it has always two aims that are inextricably linked together. One is uh, getting an objective truth right, and the other is successfully practicing morality with others, and they belong together. And actually, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say 
you getting the objective truth right, but you cannot live this with other people. And her example is um, homosexual uh, mari marriage. Um, and uh, she has the same problem like here that um, actually um, to really get, get it right, get the moral reason for this right, you, you are dependent on the possibility to live this in cooperation with others. And I think that is one uh, problem that um, occurs. And another problem, and I think that is the most, the, that is even more specific um, to reasons is that a reason that it, what I, I call it genuine justificatory injustice when the reason is really not only uh, difficult to understand or communicate, but really, really inavailable. Um, is when it is silenced by a competing reason while that um, competition is actually the result of one's position within an unjust social structure. And that's also a problem of the hermeneutics of uh, practical reasons uh, specific to that. And it comes from this that um, justification is always justification to particular others. Um, and it's not just the justification period, but giving reasons to others in a, who have a claim uh, to justification. And I think that even if you could say, okay, I could do a lot of good for society as a whole, if the people in my surrounding, if I have to drop them, or if I just cannot give them reasons that they could reasonably accept, I cannot use this reason at all. It's not justified in one respect, but in the other, and I could decide, but it is not possible for me uh, to justify. And, um, uh, so Maria, um, if she takes her reason seriously, she cannot actually justify um, uh, to leave her community and her family and invest in her career as much as she should, even though um, this reinforces injustices. And um, I think we have to take this uh, kind of injustice also um, seriously, and we have to see that. Um, it really has to do with uh, what is it to have a justificatory reason. And uh, my conclusion, yeah, so um, as I said, so I, I'm, I say that we need uh, this new, a new concept, justificatory injustice, to understand a part of the struggles and ambivalences that people like Maria face. And um, we need to acknowledge that justificatory injustices as epistemic injustices relating to the avail availability of ethical reasons have specific um, characteristics, namely that they are always dependent on the possibility to uh, live it in cooperation with others and to also give the justification to particular others. And um, uh, it's also very interesting, that's the final thing I'm going to say, is that these characteristics that you need to justify to particular others um, for really having the reason available, um, it uh, makes it the case that justificatory injustice cannot abolish merely by focusing on knowledge or communication, but it needs also a modification of uh, material conditions, like uh, Jennifer Morton, for example, has suggestions that we have to um, also shape, um, where can you live and do a job? Do you have to move away? Where are the disadvantaged communities? They should maybe be closer. It should be possible to combine uh, caring for families and um, um, having careers and also families should be supported so that even if one person really decides that they ha have to invest everything in one thing they are doing to be good at it, the family should survive that and they should not uh, end up without um, uh, care, for example. And uh, that shows uh, that um, justificatory injustice um, is, um, um, it is an epistemological problem, but it, when it comes to epistemology of um, ethical reasons, it has also these uh, specific uh, problems. And yeah, uh, thank you uh, for your attention.